Okay, welcome everyone to the September 19th meeting of the Housing and Economic Development Committee. Um, from our committee uh, this evening, we have um, myself, Molly Keegan, Bill Dwyer, Justin Pelland, Sean Berry, and Mark Howard. Um, and our first agenda item, uh, we have invited guests Barry Roberts and uh, his counsel, Tom Reedy, and they would like to discuss with us a uh, proposed project um, on the location known uh, to many in town as the old Bab Farm, which is located on uh, kind of uh, off of Rocky Hill Road uh, and north runs over to North Maple area. So, uh, Tom, looks like you're the spokesperson, huh? Take it away. Yeah, right. Um, for the record, Tom Reedy, attorney with Bacon Wilson out of Amherst. Uh, with me, Barry Roberts, and uh, thank you very much to the committee and also to you, Molly, for the introduction and the time. Um, I'll share my screen in a minute. I just want to kind of orient everyone with the location we're talking about. As Molly mentioned, it's the Bab Farm, which you probably already know, but I think it's good to get an aerial and then to talk about uh, what the proposal is. Uh, and, and Bill, I'll ask you to jump in where and as necessary, um, because there is, uh, we, we hope that there is a zoning amendment on the town meeting warrant for November to extend the senior housing overlay district to include the bad property and some other land, but candidly we're most interested in in the bab property and so i'll talk a little bit about senior housing overlay uh where it exists currently uh, i'll show you the, the the bab property we'll talk a little bit about that and then just i mean at this point they're really high level conceptual ideas we don't have a plan to show you of here's what it's going to look like but we can talk through kind of the numbers um and oh, as no. Tom, if I could just jump in here now that we sure. have some more people here, I, I just want to emphasize that this is all hypothetical at this point. This proposal depends upon a, a rezoning action taken at Fall Town Meeting, which is now going to be, uh, I think, November 14th or some. Mm -hmm. um, and um, it, this proposal cannot proceed under current zoning. Okay, Perfect. and just um, briefly again, just for uh, you know, open meeting law requirements, I just want to announce that uh, Crystal has joined our meeting as well. Okay, Tom. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and Bill, you took the words right out of my mouth. Even though we're going to be talking about this this property, what, what we're really looking for is hopefully some some feedback, but also support uh, when this does go in front of town meeting, and we can talk about kind of the housing and economic development reasons why. So. What I'll do right now is let me share my screen. Just I've got the Hadley GIS up to, to orient everyone to the Bab property. So if you can see my screen, it's this yellow highlighted property. It is including these couple of parcels here, about 30 acres. Um, we have had the wetlands flagged by uh, a wetland scientist. We haven't gone through the ANRAD process yet. Uh, the ANRAD is abbreviated notice of resource area delineation, which would lock in where those resource areas are. Um, but we have a sense of where they are on the property. Um, you've got Rocky Hill to the north. You've got 116 to the east. You've got North uh, Maple to the west. There's frontage here on North Maple, and then there's frontage here on Rocky Hill. I will zoom out just a little bit to give it a little bit more context. Route 9 is down here to the south. Uh, Amherst is obviously a little bit further to the east. And so hopefully this works. I'm going to show you where the existing senior housing overlay district is. Uh, hopefully you've already seen the change in the plan uh, or the map. So what you have here, it's a little bit dark burgundy, I, I might call it. Uh, this area here is the existing senior housing overlay district. If I zoom in, you can see that, uh, you know, outside of these farm fields, much of what you have here is already developed. Um, 
there is, and I think, again, Bill, correct me if I'm wrong, is when I looked at the bylaw, I think the senior housing overlay district came into effect in 2008. And I believe that uh, the only project permitted under that overlay district was this project right here, which is East Street Commons, uh, which Barry actually developed. It's 35 units. Um, assessed value ranges from 300000 to, let's say, 400000 dollars per unit and there's 35 units altogether. Uh, senior housing uh, requires a few different things. There's dimensional regulations, but there's also an age restriction. At least one member of the household has to be over 55. And so uh, it couldn't be, let's say, four 20-year-olds or four 30-year-olds or two 20-year-olds. You have to have someone over 55 and there is a deed restriction that carries on with the, with the property. Um, you can have no more than 50, five zero units on a single parcel. This is set up as a condominium and you can't have more than 50 units and each of those units cannot be more than two bedrooms. So the maximum number of bedrooms that you could have on a property is 100. And so let me just stop my share for a second, and then I'm going to show you what the uh, proposed, oh, the, the revised, I guess, the extension of the overlay district would be to include that the BAB property, and then I'll go back to the, the GIS. And so now if you can see my screen, up here is the BAB property that we showed you earlier 30 acres it's got these farm fields uh the proposal um which will hopefully ultimately be in front of the select board and then uh, back to the planning board for a, a hearing on october 1st and then ultimately on the town meeting warrant is to extend the existing senior housing overlay district to include this area of land so bounded to the north by rocky hill to the east by 116 to the south by Route 9, and to the west by North Maple. Uh, much of it is already developed. You've got Venture Way, and obviously you know, most of you know of the development that exists there. Um, you've got a hotel, office building. I think the Wendy's is right there, the McDonald's, the Verizon. There are some existing dwellings here, here, and then up here. And so uh, this is the property uh, Barry would look to develop but to avoid spot zoning, and we think for uh, completeness, the proposal is to rezone as an overlay district, this entire area bordered as we've shown. And so I'll just get back to the GIS for a moment, talk a little bit about what a proposal may look like. Okay, so you've got, as I was saying, Rocky Hill to the north and then North Maple to the west. It's most likely that there would be a loop road, you know, connecting uh, Rocky Hill to North Maple. Barry would be looking to get as many units as possible, uh, not to exceed 50, each with two bedrooms. You know, as, as I ballpark it, given, well, let's assume a $400,000 assessed value of each of those at, at 50, that's a $20 million value at your current tax rate. That's about $227,000 of annual uh, tax income as a result of this project. The roads in the project would remain private. There would be a pump station. Barry's already talked to DPW. There would need to be a pump station because of the uh, elevation difference between the sides of the property. Uh, there is, as we understand it, sewer capacity. There would be sewer tie-in over on North Maple. And there would have to be, like I said, that sewer pump to, to get it up to a certain place and then to have it uh, gravity fed. And so East Street Commons, and maybe Barry can talk a little bit about East Street Commons. I believe there's, what is it, Barry, two or three units left out of the 35? There are two units left to finish, number 30 and number 20. Uh, we just transferred uh, unit 13 this week. 
Um, so they will be done by November with this project. And so I'm sure, you know, and we're happy to stop and answer questions at any point, but I'm sure Barry could tell you the inquiries that he gets for senior housing. Um, and when we look at the housing production plan and we realize that, you know, there's there's a need for the, I'll say, rehousing of had specifically Hadley seniors for maybe downsizing, you know, a lot of the units in East Street Commons, as I would suspect here, would be 1,300 to 1,600 square feet. Um, and to th the nice thing about a development like this is that it also, it, it would be a condominium and so there would be condominium fees and the condominium fees would cover uh, snow plowing, landscaping, lawn mowing, et cetera. The, the provision of the maintenance services that a lot of the times folks who are, we'll call it aging in place, uh, don't they would have to hire somebody to do because they just would not necessarily be able to or want to uh, handle all of that maintenance over time. I have a yeah. question. Yeah, please. Uh, when you say senior housing, uh, what you're describing that I'm understanding is just condominiums for seniors that can afford it, not specifically for the elderly, correct? So you have to be over 55 to right. even live here mm -hmm. um there would be market rate and then there would be under the zoning bylaw there's a requirement to provide 15 percent of the total units as uh, i'm going to use quotes affordable um it's i use quotes because it's technically it technically means qualified on the subsidized housing inventory and so there would be those affordable units built on site as part of the overall development okay and is that the same that is on the East Street Commons? The affordable housing is included with that as well? There is, There are no affordable units provided in that uh, development. What we did at that time was, and this was the first time we went through it, so we've learned a lot from it, as I think Bill can probably attest to, there was a payment in lieu. And so there's there has been funding and there will continue to be funding of uh an affordable of the affordable housing trust in town um and so that money is going into the affordable housing trust however for this project there would be built on site those actual units which would would look the same uh same square footage number of bedrooms finishes etc as the market rate units but just be permanently qualified on the subsidized housing inventory. so while there was a requirement to do it, there was a payment in lieu available, which we availed ourselves of in that one, but kind of learning about the uh, difficulties associated with that, we've been asked to, and I think vol could, would volunteer to put those affordable units on site at this project. Okay, one more question. What happens when the condominium uh, owner retires? Retires, retires. Sure. Yeah, no, everybody, hey, everybody's asking that question, Barry. Maybe they know something. Um, so the way the condominiums work and the way we construct the documents here, and let me stop sharing for a second, just so I'm looking at you and not at the, the screen next to me. Um, the nice thing about the condominium is there would be the development of all the condominium units. And then each of the unit owners would hold a beneficial interest in the condominium trust. And then at a certain period of time, and it's usually at the earlier to occur of uh, when the developer doesn't own any more units or seven years is the date that we put in. At that point, the condominium unit owners, and this is actually what's happening currently at East Street Commons, the condominium unit owners will take control of the condominium. And so they will be the members of the board of trustees or the, the trustees of the condominium. They're the ones that will hire a management company if they want. They will maintain uh, the the roads, the sidewalks. They'll make decisions. So if they want to change, um, you know, what people can have outside of their property, they can do that. So th it's, it's actually a really great succession plan uh, that has some finite date there. So it's not just, you know, Barry, for example, controlling this in perpetuity. It actually goes to those folks that, that uh, are at. And, and that are at the condominium. So that's the so, 
basically ownership can transfer to a family member or no? Um, within the, so a condominium unit, if it's owned by someone, so someone has to be over 55 to actually yeah. own it. There is a grace period, and I don't remember what that time period is, frankly, off the top of my head. I don't know if it's like a year or two years where they would have, like, let's say that uh, mom and dad own it, dad passes away, mom owns it, mom passes away. What happens? There's a grace period where the, the kids would be able to, you know, if they're not 55 and would want to move in, they have an opportunity to ultimately transition it to somebody else that's over 55. So. Oh it wouldn't necessarily stay in the family just because the parents owned it. Right. It would have to go to somebody that's over 55, but after a certain period of time to get the affairs in order. And they can choose who they would want. So it can stay in the family if they have family members, 55 and older. Sure. Okay. That's what I wanted to know if this was something that can be passed on or it's just a one-time thing because most condominiums are just a one-time thing. Yeah, folks could definitely keep it in the family as long as they met that um, requirement. The age requirement. Yeah, okay. precisely. Thank you. Sure. So, um, I mean, I'm happy to answer any other questions that you have. I think, you know, I'll share my screen maybe once more just to show you some of the surrounding area, the size of the lots in that area, because I think there's maybe an important. Um, people people will worry about potential density but when you look at some of the surrounding development right here and over here these are 15 16 thousand square feet for a lot of these lots these are a little bit bigger at about 23 24 thousand square feet if you were to get 50 units here on 30 acres that would equal about uh what do i have about 26 thousand square feet per unit. That's not to say that each unit would have 26,000 square feet. It's just to say that when you take a unit to square foot ratio, you're about the same as these uh, and greater than these over here. So just for somewhat comparative density. Um, and so when we talk about the 50 units, that's the maximum that Barry would look to develop on that site. And so not only are you providing housing uh, for seniors with potential for the provision of maintenance services plus affordable. Uh, then there's also the real estate tax consequences of, you know, $270,000 a year of, of new income to the town without necessarily any burdening of the services um, for, for schools particularly. So we'd love feedback. Yes, yeah, please. Just while you're, you're talking about revenue generation, um, the same would hold true on the water and sewer side, correct? Do you want to talk about that? Yeah, and Barry, maybe you know a little bit more about the numbers associated uh, with that, but there's certainly connection fees and then obviously annual charges. Yes. In order for us to tie into the sewer, there's connection fee every time we tie in that goes to the DPW. We tie, we tie in sewer and water once we connect a house, and plus the town will never have to repair the sewer or the water system because it belongs to the condo association. So they get the benefit of charging for the water and charging for the sewer, but not any, having a downside if something breaks, having to fix it. So not only do they get the one-time charge when we tie in, and it's based upon the square footage of the Home, it's fifteen, sixteen hundred dollars every time I tie a house in, and uh, then it becomes the condominium association responsibility in perpetuity. So the town just gets the luxury of collecting for the usage. And it's also not to say, Molly, anything about building permit fees either, right? We haven't gone through and kind of uh, itemized what all that would be, but you have water, sewer, real estate, and then building permit fees as well. Sure. And the other thing I think it would be helpful to to put this in context. I mean, the, the, the first question, um, anybody who's heard about this project, well, I shouldn't say anybody, but several people um, who've heard about the projects, the very first question they ask is, wait a minute, 
we're doing everything we can to preserve open space. Why on earth would we build on this property? Right. And I, I think there's an answer to that, correct? There's there's probably a few answers uh, to <laughs> that. Um, you know, I think w one of the answers is that, you know, I was here not too long ago with a different housing developer, Trinitas, who was looking for, I think, 224 units uh, to place on this parcel. Um, and so kind of the simple answer is it's going to be developed at some point with something. My sense is because there's a willing seller who's actively looking to find somebody to develop it. And so to a certain extent, why not have it with a local developer who's going to do over 55 housing with no more than 50 units? And I think, personal opinion, Barry is sensitive to preserving open space if he's able to preserve open space. And I think there's, you know, I'll show, share the screen again, because I think there's a few areas, um, you know, to the greatest extent possible, if we can keep, you know, this area here undeveloped, this area here undeveloped, and concentrate the development into this area here, um, you know, I don't know the exact calculation of what the open space to development would be, but there is still going to be some preservation of open space in this area. And then, like I said, the, the simple answer is somebody's coming knocking on the door, whether it at some point is a 40B project because either the state modifies what that safe harbor is to be above 10%, or the year round housing units in Hadley adjust so that from your 11 point, whatever it is, you drop down below 10% and aren't availed of that safe harbor. This is a developable piece of property for someone. If yeah, I can, I'm, if I yeah, could no. just add the, um, yeah, the property is not protected for whatever reason of their own choosing, the property owners have elected not to proceed with the APR program. I don't know if they're in one of the tax chapter programs, um, but it is unprotected. And it that makes it available for uh, single family residential development virtually by right. There would be a subdivision uh, approval process, but uh, it would support a road from Rocky Hill Road through to North Maple Street. Um, I can't project how many houses could be built there, um, more with septic than um, it would be larger lots because it is in the Aquifer Protection Overlay District. So it'd have to be, um, larger lots if it was on septic but uh theoretically they could tie into sewer as well uh, i'm not sure how the numbers would work out uh tom you want to venture a guess maybe 20 houses 24 houses i think you might have hit the nail on the head bill as i was thinking about it 20 to 25 is where i was at so it's you know it's a million three hundred and six thousand square feet if you take 10 percent away for infrastructure etc you're left with about enough at 40,000 square feet per lot for 29, which that's just math numbers, nothing else. Uh, so I think 20 to 25 is probably where I got to. Um, and as you said, that single family homes could be four beds, could be, you know, you, the town loses quite a bit of um, ability to control what goes there at, at that point. Zoning does not allow us to control the style of single family residential properties. So uh, there'd be no site plan approval process, no design review. Uh, we'd just be presented with a layout of lots and uh, would probably have to approve it because there's no real compelling reason not to. So is it reasonable to assume again if if the um, you know the the numbers were right and the current owners wanted to go down that path instead that we'd likely be looking um, you know from a developer's standpoint they would want to be doing more of what's gone on in in the northern part of Hadley right I mean we'd be looking at likely 
over 3,000 square foot, four bedroom type housing. Um, you know, so when I, I just think of, I, you know, keep coming back to the, the work that was done on the housing production plan. And I, and I understand zoning changes are, are needed here, you know, to make it over 55 if, if it's the will of town meeting. But this sort of a development would be more in concert with that aspect of the housing production plan and the master plan. You know, we have an aging population and, and um, you know, the documented need for over 55. And one of the other things, Molly, that I would be fearful of is if, you know, and I'm, I do, I'm based in Amherst. I do a lot of work in Amherst. I see what happens in Amherst as far as investors buying I know where you're going. <laughs> single family homes and renting them out to students, right? And if this isn't so far, in fact, it's probably perfect uh, if, if you wanted to have 25 single family homes of four bedrooms or students, uh, I fear for what that actually looked like. And that's not what Barry's here saying he's going to do, just to be clear with everybody. But I could imagine somebody coming in, a student housing developer, and saying, oh, wait, we, we can do this by right, and then we can rent it to whoever we want, and then we're, we're this close to the university? It's a no-brainer. And so, you know, because you, you can, I'll tell you, in Amherst, it's $5,800 uh, for a four-bedroom per month, right? So $6,000 a four-bedroom, you got twenty five four bedrooms there, uh, at, let's say 6,000 a month, that's $150,000 a month. They're probably making some money off of that, right? To, to pay debt service, taxes, et cetera. Um, and that probably ends up putting a burden on a lot, of the, a lot of the Hadley municipal services, whether it's police fire or families do move in, which wouldn't be a bad thing, but then and I read in the housing production plan, the school has the capacity to do it, but it's just something that we've got to think about. Um, if, because like I said, something's going to go there. Okay. So does anybody have any um, questions or comments for Tom and, and Barry? I do, yeah. Um, first, uh, don't need to take this too far, but I was once a student, I once rented, and now I'm a homeowner at Hadley. I just, I take issue with the way that people in this town seem to stand on the you know, student population as this, you know, aggressive overtaking of our town, I just don't think that that's true. They're not a monolith. You know, there's grad students, there's PhD students, there's uh, researchers, there's faculty, there's staff. Um, so just, I'm just going to make that point. The, the last thing I'll say is really about this development. We talked about this the first time we saw this site. I think the need for housing is critical, and I would support a proposal like this for that reason. But, and this is the big caveat, and we've seen this in several of the resident surveys through the housing production plan and a recent one with the Smart Growth Committee, there's a lot of opposition to taking over farmland and open space and a lot of recognition that there's really underutilized properties elsewhere in town. I'll bring up that the current senior housing overlay has abandoned buildings and empty retail storefronts in it already. And so I think it's a little disingenuous to look at this and say, you know, we want to extend the district but it's really only because that lot is available and easily developable. That for me is you know, good enough reason to develop housing for sure, but the number one priority of the people in this town is to preserve open space in our agricultural heritage. To that extent, I think it's a shame that we continue to look at properties that have never been developed previously when we have so many distressed properties that could be put to better use. So that's, that's where I'll couch my comment. And I imagine based on what we've seen in some of the resident surveys that you'll get a similar reaction at town meeting. I can't predict that, but I know that the sentiment is pretty strong that the agricultural heritage of this town should be preserved. Yeah, and that's, um, to that point, Justin, that's that's why I, I pose that up front. Um, I think if you have somebody with ownership rights, and you know, as Bill said, they the family has chosen for whatever reason not to put this in APR and protect the property. Um, we, we can't force their hand. So, you know, the question that that town meeting would have to address is in order to convince the current owners to restrict the property from developing, um, there's a price tag with that. And, right. I'm, I'm and not suggesting that we, we restrict it. And, I'm, and I wouldn't suggest that it needs to go into APR either. I, I think open space is open space, whether it's protected or not. 
what we're really talking about is, and this has come up a number of times, that you know, we don't have a planner. There's no one looking at the town from a land use perspective and saying, where should we put uses? And in fact, I think I saw uh, someone, maybe it was Bill, had clarified from the planning board's perspective that you know the zoning for the um, storage facility that just got put in South Maple, you know, it's been zoned that way since the 60s because it was a, a, a railway and it had coal and those are all valid reasons to zone an industrial. The reality is that that was 50 plus years ago and we haven't changed it. So I think that there's a growing recognition in this town that land use practices need to be controlled in some way and, you know, and have foresight in how we choose to develop land in Hadley. Otherwise you end up with the kind of sprawl you see out in Boston, whereas there's land available, it gets developed and eventually you end up with, you know, an hour and a half commute to get to your job. It's, it's not a great place to be. Yeah. So I'm not standing in opposition to the project. I think it's a much more reasonable scale versus the previous scheme that we saw. I think the 55 plus protection, it's obviously a community that needs housing, especially for those who want to stay in town. For all those reasons, I would support the proposal, but I just need to stress that point that this has been you know, raised time and time again that open space, protected or not, is a uh, vital importance to the community. That's a great point and we appreciate it. Um, one response, not necessarily about the open space piece, but about your comment with some of the abandoned buildings down within the senior housing overlay district. One of the, uh, maybe I'll call it uh, inadequacies of the existing senior housing overlay is that it doesn't allow uh, a building that has more than four units in it. So you don't, like you wouldn't, on those lots, and, and there's also um, per square foot requirements of how many units you can actually have on a lot. And so to actually redevelop, and if you know the cost of construction now, it's um, pretty significant. And so that probably is a secondary consideration that, that the town should have, in all honesty, is to maybe take a look at that existing senior housing overlay district and see if there's a way to increase density um, to incentivize that redevelopment. Because I think there's probably some really great places, Railroad Street, I can, you know, comes to mind, there's some places there where you could really do some meaningful redevelopment, but you got to allow a little additional density because that's the only way the numbers are going to work for developers. So I don't disagree at all with what you're saying, including about the students, right? And we're here in Amherst and Barry will tell you, uh, the the properties that he manages, it's a mix of people, right? There'll be some undergrads, there'll be some graduate students, there's affordable units in there, right? He's got, I can't tell you how many altogether, I'd say over a hundred units altogether, and it's a real mix and managed appropriately. You know, it, it's not the, the windmill that people tilt at, so to speak. Sean, Crystal, Mark, anything for, for Tom or Barry? No. No, I agree with Justin, and it's, it's a better proposal than the last one. Um, in my mind, it's a better for the town than uh, open development of 25 houses. That could be, you know, half a million to a million dollars a piece. I do want to emphasize that <laughs> if the senior set housing overlay was expanded to this property, it would not preclude the development of single family homes. Single right. family right. homes are allowed by right in the underlying district. So it would just open another doorway uh, for um, uh, for development of, of condos uh, if they're over 55, but the um, it doesn't preclude single family. And Bill, the, the um I guess I'm going to date myself. I still call it the McKesson building, um, but the, you know, class A space or whatever. Um, so looking at the map that, that Tom put up, uh, with that, you know, Verizon, the two uh, fast food places that's picking up McKesson and the hotel that's there. That is correct. Okay. And do we know what the status of that McKesson building, um, what it is right now? So that's this, the one that's uh, uh, the number thirty down down at the street that uh, sorry, has a combination of uh, uh, you know, Cooley Dickinson Rehab is in there. Uh, Bulkley Richardson and Jolinas has their uh, yep. Hampshire County office in there. I don't know 
Who Amherst else? Emerson College, is in there? I think, has something in there. I think Emerson College has some office space in there as well. Mm -hmm. At one point, um, State Street Bank had a remote mm -hmm. crisis facility there, which is why it has such generous generating capacity. I don't know if they're still there or not. Okay. I know periodically people ask about that. Um, so I, I wasn't aware of the fact that it was, you know, being sold or anything like that. It just, I think it has uh, less vacancy than it did at one point in time. So actually, if it really came down to it, the zoning bylaw for 55 and over says in the overlay district or existing structures, wherever located. So that has, that site has the potential of being redeveloped without regard to whether the overlay district is extended, because I believe it was in existence at the time of the adoption of the overlay. Uh, that's um, just point of curiosity, yeah. Yep. Okay. Al although to Tom's point, uh, it probably couldn't be developed economically because of the density restrictions we have. Which Same with the I hotel. would say we've we've amended we've gone back to town meeting at least twice, if not three times after the bylaw was adopted in order to tweak it to address concerns specifically identified by Barry Roberts and his team that mm -hmm. uh, you know we can't make it work because we can't reconcile this section of the bylaw with that section of the bylaw. We looked at it and said, yeah, you're right. Um and uh, went back to town meeting to uh, modify those terms. So it, it it has been worked on several times, and we're happy to look at other things. I, we do have a proposal for increased density that will probably come forward to spring town meeting from other clients of Mr. Reedy. Uh, so we'll see how that works. All right. Well, appreciate you guys taking the time to, um, you know, really go through this thoroughly with us. And I, I'm sure if we have any other questions, we'll reach back out for clarification or additional information. And then we'll watch and see how your ongoing conversations with the planning board go. That sounds Thank you very good. much. Yeah, we really appreciate it. Hopefully we're back. If, it, if we are successful at town meeting, we'll come back before with whatever we're actually proposing so we can get some input at that point. That'd be great. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Barry. Thanks, Come Barry. Okay. Um, so next on the agenda, we have the 40R update, uh, which is the, the Smart Growth Committee. So, Justin, do you want to provide um, update on that? Sure. So the survey that we had sent out um, in June or July, I can't remember when now, uh, that closed. Um, the beginning of September, and uh, we collected all the responses and started to um, kind of parse the data to figure out where the sentiments of our residents lie. So we're in the process of working through that, and that's going to help to inform our next engagement session, which we're, uh, I forget what we're calling it now. We started calling it focus groups. But the idea is it's going to be, you know, gathering small to medium groups of people uh, to discuss specific questions or concerns that came out of some of these surveys, survey results. Uh, so that we can then uh, eventually move it into a uh, town vote. There, there may be a third engagement session, I'm forgetting. Um, we had a Smart Growth Committee meeting on Monday where we kind of discussed the survey results. Uh, I'd encourage everybody to watch that meeting. Um, and I, I can also, I think I can circulate the survey results uh, once we're done here. But there's a lot, I mean, there's a lot of good feedback in there, a lot of really great comments, suggestions, things about, you know, what about this side of town? What about this property? So there's, there's some good content in there to help inform you know, where we take this effort. Uh, but there's also quite a bit of, uh, you know, what I would say is, is pretty extreme and hateful rhetoric towards uh, immigrants, migrant communities. Uh, this is a theme, I think, that I've been hearing for a while now, but to see it in writing, some of these comments are, are uh, pretty upsetting. Uh, so I, I would encourage you to read through these and just understand, you know, wh where people's sentiments are, you know, where their opinions fall. And, um, you know, some of these comments I, I said on the committee meeting on Monday that I, I condemn them. I don't think that they're appropriate for uh, zoning and policy discussions, but they are informative and, you know, they are members of the public and, and our neighbors. So uh, it's something that we have to acknowledge and uh, react to to some extent. 
but um, I can I can share all that after the meeting, and you're all welcome to peruse at your leisure. Okay. And when are you meeting again, Justin? I think our next meeting is October. Uh, give me a second. October twenty first, I think. Yeah, October twenty first. All right. Um, any questions on that? Okay. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see the um, uh, whatever you can share with us. Appreciate that. So uh, next on the agenda, we have uh, kind of a planning board update. So first, Bill, any um, projects that are in front of you, and then um, after that, the zoning articles that will be on the public town meeting. The only um, active thing we have is the dental dental office at 101 East Street, mm -hmm. and we reviewed the plans. Uh, Tuesday night, um, they're going to come back in um, in a month with revised, somewhat revised plans. We had some concerns about the parking, how it was laid out. Um, we've had a couple of minor inquiries, um, you know, odd, odds and ends of what's going on. Liquors 44 is expanding into the H&R block space, and H&R block is moving elsewhere in that complex but that's no net change in coverage. Um, we had uh, the current owner, the new owners of the Stop and Shop Plaza did ask about putting self-storage facilities to the rear. Uh, we haven't heard anything new about that. Um, Bank of America wants to come and uh, be on the opposite corner of uh, South Maple and Route 9. Uh, where the AT&T store is presently. Um, the uh, Dave's Chicken is going to be converting the uh, People's Bank building. They uh, say they want to make it look less like a, a bank. So they're taking the People's Bank architecture, which was kind of nice, and making it really boxy like the bank branches that are going up across the street. So, um, well, we'll see. We'll see how they last uh yeah. jersey mike's is coming uh skinny pancake is coming they're all taking spaces that were previously occupied by other businesses and jersey but, mike's is going in next to 110 grill or that yes, trip? which yeah. was sports clips sports clips okay uh so there, there's activity but uh not uh, major development activity at this point uh, so we we have three zoning articles that we are two that we are sponsoring and one that we have just for convenience advanced to town meeting uh, the um, expansion of the over 55 uh overlay district um we're 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 we are submitting it to the, uh, we submitted it to the agenda. That's one route. Otherwise, he would have to get a uh, voter petition to 10 signatures to get it on. Um, so distinction without a difference, maybe it's not an article that we are supporting per se uh, or drafting. It is, but it's one that we're al allowing to go forward. We have a second article that removes some obsolete references um, and then our third article is a response to the, um, somewhat out of the blue, uh, um, a governor's, uh, modification to allow accessory dwelling units by right, whether detached or attached to existing structures. We presently allow it by special permit for attached structures. I was thinking we would be proposing to make that by right since it has been pretty seamless going forward, but we do not presently allow detached accessory apartments, accessory dwelling units. Uh, we now have to. So we're trying to get uh, get a handle on, on some reasonable restrictions. Um, We'll see how, how it works. As uh, Jim highlighted at our uh, planning board meeting, there are 
uh, two competing forces at the state level. Uh, one is energy efficiency and one is housing availability. And they don't seem to mesh all that well because when you have the stretch energy code, with heavier construction, heavier insulation, more expensive, basically more expensive, more expense to be more energy efficient, um, kind of defeats the goal of putting the accessory dwelling unit in the backyard uh, as a low cost alternative. Um, we're going to see, we have no idea how that's going to play out. The bylaw, the legislation doesn't become effective until February. But based on um, information we've received from council, um, what they're doing with some other towns, we're, we're trying to put something together that will let us have some oversight and we'll see. It's, um, it's going to come as a costly surprise, I think, to a lot of people who are thinking it would be really easy to pop a rental unit into my backyard when they find out uh, sewer costs, construction costs, whether they can even do it. Uh, some of those lots that uh, Tom was showing you, there are 20,000 square feet. They're already pretty much built out to um, to the boundaries. Um, they, the house is taking up the setbacks. There's no room to put an accessory, a de detached accessory unit in. So it we just have to see how it plays out. So how do, um, I've had multiple people ask me if this means that we could see tiny houses. Technically, no, no they still Should, minimum. Yeah. Well, yes, you could see tiny houses. The, the, the maximum dimension is 900 square feet or one half the floor area of the principal structure, whichever is less. Um, so someone is not obligated to build to 900, but there are also um, sanitary code requirements for minimum habitable area. So uh, something like uh, the tiny house that popped up on East Street on mm -hmm. a trailer would, uh, would not work. Um, someone who wants to build a less than 900 square foot house that complies with the building code that will work uh mm -hmm. but the question just comes at what point does the w where does the cost benefit analysis take you mm -hmm. but i could i could see situations where you know i think you know multi-generational where you know parents are um have a property that they're selling you know, and for safety and proximity and everything that goes along with multi-generational living, you know, they could have the resources to pay for the costly modifications to someone's home. Uh, you know, I've seen that happen with folks where, you know, they sold their home for the sake of argument for $400,000 and willingly turn that over to their daughter or whomever to help pay for the modification uh, to create the ex the accessory. So, you know, we may see some activity oh, in that we, we have multiple examples of that. There's no no mm -hmm. question that, um, as I said, the old, we do allow by special permit accessory apartments that are attached and there is no requirement of relationship. Right. So uh, it can be for a parent, it can be a parent creating a space for a child. It can be um, a property owner creating a rental unit. Mm -hmm. In fact, the rental unit can be the primary structure and the owner currently could be in the, uh, in the accessory unit. Mm -hmm. um, the bylaw, the new change of statute is also going to remove a requirement of uh owner occupancy so um to tom's point there is a possibility someone could buy a house build an ex detached accessory unit in the backyard and rent both of them mm -hmm. um how likely that is we 
we don't have any track record of how this has played out or how this is going to play out. We've had, I'd say we've had virtually no complaints. We only had a couple of situations where someone who had already riled up the neighborhood um, wanted to squeeze more rental space into their their dwelling. And um, in both cases, they, those applications were withdrawn in the face of neighborhood opposition. Um, but otherwise, um, the ones that have been approved and built have been with I have I've heard no complaints. But whether those again, those are all attached, we start to get detached. Um, we'll see it has more potential for disruption, but that doesn't mean it's going to happen. Mm -hmm. I have a question, Bill. Uh, come come February, will attached apartments still need a special permit? No. Okay. Whether attached or detached, accessory units will be by right. So essentially, our bylaw that says one dwelling per uh, lot might as well be rewritten to say two dwellings per lot. Okay. But it wouldn't, it wouldn't really support a true duplex. Uh, right one is always going to be subordinate to the other. So um, I I'm, forget exactly how we're going to finesse that section. I think uh, one dwelling per lot, except is otherwise provided in this bylaw. Um, right. for, uh, for what it's worth, I'll say my generation is pretty ecstatic um, and younger generations. I've got so many friends with, with young kids living in tiny apartments, paying $2,500, $2,800 a month, and they can't buy a house because they, you know, a house that used to go for $400,000 five years ago is $800,000 now. It may not seem like these accessory dwelling units work on paper, but when you think about it, the reality is like Molly was saying, you know, there's a lot of people out there in their 20s, 30s, even 40s who can't afford their own home. So if it comes down to it and a $300,000 construction loan is available and they can build one of these accessory dwelling units, that's a lot better situation for them than $800,000 mortgage with a $4,000 a month payment. Well, yeah, except I don't think it's going to be that simple. You're not going to be getting a more... You, property owner still has to has to get the mortgage. Uh, not always. Yeah, You can get a HELOC, you can set up a non-profit and do a limited equity ownership model, you can set it up as an LLC and have joint ownership. It, there's a lot of different ways that our generation is starting to look at trying to do this because we've been locked out of home ownership. It's impossible. Yeah, but, it, you know, I'm a real estate lawyer. The banks aren't lending on partial interests. Yes, they'll lend to an LLC and the LLC can have one or 20 members, but it still comes down to the LLC, so okay, yes, the LLC can build a primary structure and a secondary structure, but it's the LLC, not, um, yeah, I, I think people are going to find the application of the rules are going to be disappointing to a lot of people. It, it, there's a lot of misunderstanding out there about what can come in. I just think a lot of a lot of parcels in Hadley will not support a detached accessory unit, and then people will have to make the call about whether they want to crunch their existing space. But we're not going to be subdividing lots so that someone can take out a mortgage to build an accessory unit in someone else's backyard. No, I don't, I don't think that's true. I think we're just excited that there's an opportunity to build something that's not a five bedroom, $800,000 house. It's, it's right. ridiculous. Hadley's housing portfolio is so unachievable for the vast majority of Americans. So even, even if one of these units got built, that's one opportunity for a family to build wealth. Crystal, you want to say something? Yeah, I, I have a question. Um, it may not, um, be receptive but i just want to know as far as hadley what can we do to make 
affordable living better for the next generation or the generation under us because as Justin stated, it, it's very, it, it's almost impossible basically for anyone in that generation to purchase a, a house, let alone afford the mortgage once they've purchased the house. And that's just the mortgage. We're not talking about anything that's outside of the insurance that will, may be included with the mortgage. So I, I do hear a lot of um, information for elderly, which is excellent because that's one thing I've mentioned, mentioned since day one. But I just wanted to know, is there anything that Hadley can do to start something to give hope to our generation that's come you know, after us and, and their children? Just a question of, is there a possibility? Well, sure. Well, I think well, this 40 that, are. Yeah. That's exactly what the committee that Justin is on is working towards. Right. Uh, different zoning rules applied in different districts so that there may be more density and you know honestly the the if you leave it completely to the market uh you're going to see million dollar houses I, i've had conversations with developers and once you buy the land which might be 150 to 200,000 to start with, um, it's more profitable to put up a million dollar house than a $300,000. Well, if you already have 200,000 into the land, you're not going to put a house that retails for 400,000 on it. Um, the average, the, the developer is not going to do that. That's why the market is, why the McMansions are, are selling. Mm -hmm. uh, well, and the then very Justin's working on will have is working towards more condos, townhouses, smaller properties. Uh, and then there is this new state law and accessory units, which will give some flexibility. Uh, remains to be seen how how it's going to work out. And Bill, question: So in, in um in the proposal that, you know, we just heard, again, we understand the zoning doesn't exist right now, but what um, Barry Roberts uh, is thinking about for 55, uh, you know, and, and let's just assume that, you know, maxed it out was putting up 50 units. So 15% would be, you know, seven houses or whatever. So, so if seven of the units were affordable, uh, in that category of affordable and the price point i'm making this up is four hundred and fifty thousand dollars you know the market value of one of the non-affordable units what would the price point be for an affordable unit is I there don't a formula there is okay. uh, and it is uh defined very broadly as something affordable to someone who is making no more there there are a couple of layers but some to affordable to someone who's making no more than 80 percent of the or median or median income um, yeah. and then um you have to factor in um taxes insurance um and um, interest, um, and so you sort of back into what the price is, and um, uh, it, it, it. If you do it all the time, it's fine. I, I mentioned the rental agents at uh, at the existing uh, subsidy income controlled properties can do the calculations while you sit there and find out if you're eligible. Mm -hmm. uh, and I see Justin just sent around a link. Yeah. If you yeah sorry, I sent last year as an accident. It says 20. Okay. Yeah. You know, it'd be better if you could send it by email to the group because anything in the chat disappears when the meeting oh. ends. Good to know. Yeah. This is just an example, but it shows you how they break down AMI. It's based on number of people and 
there's different thresholds for percentages, but I'll circulate this via email now. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so I'm I, with the income side of it, but I was just curious, like how that translates to an actual purchase price for a property. Uh, right? Well, that's that's where it gets interesting. The reason yeah. that we agreed fi in the end with Barry to do a payment in lieu for the East Street Commons was that trying to structure this for a sale transaction, an equity transaction, was proving to be very difficult. Um, essentially, he would have had to hire someone to run a lottery, pre-qualified people, run a lottery, mm -hmm. and for six units, say. And then, as each individual owner move to turn those units over they would have to go through a simplified version of the same exercise mm -hmm. and the the catch at the time and i'm not sure if there have been any changes if they went through that simple that version of the exercise of basically trying to find uh eligible people who could buy it at whatever the determined price was and they couldn't get anyone that was eligible to buy it the restriction could be stripped off it, it would take like a, a two a year or two of trying and then we would have lost that unit to the invent from the inventory um so with all of those factors in play uh, it made sense. Uh, we also had another state agencies. One one branch isn't talking to the other. Um, the at the time, the executive office of housing and economic development. I, they've changed now, but at one time, they had a division that that oversaw the zoning code and recommended in the. In, the, in their sample inclusionary zoning bylaw that the local housing authority be the search agency for the um, affordability. The local housing authority reports to a different office in the same executive office and was told to run as fast, uh, run away from <laughs> this as fast as you can. So, um, it's one of those catch-22. So anyway, for all, all of that, af after going around with Barry and, and his team for over a year, we finally went for the payment in lieu for that. Uh, we've already told him we really don't want to do that again. Um, and he is actually thinking about maybe keeping the affordable units in a separate ownership maybe they will be owned by an llc that will manage them as rental properties and it is a lot easier to qualify tenants for rental properties than it is to qualify purchasers to take over restricted properties hmm. the um the senior housing in Amherst, uh, the the Winfield part that's in Amherst, uh, a couple of the buildings are all rentals just for that reason. Mm -hmm. um, and I think they do have condos there, but I don't know if the condos are age restrict are income restricted. They are age restricted. Yeah. Complicated. That's but. why it's hard. <laughs> You want to say something, Crystal? You are muted. No, you're muted, Crystal. Uh, I didn't. OK, we'll now we can hear you. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, Megan just came with her son, so I think people are. Okay. I can think she's got a. Um, Another DEI meeting, probably. I, I didn't hear what you said, Molly. 
Oh, we, we thought you were trying to talk to us and we were letting you know you were muted. All right. Well, if there's nothing else, on, um, does anybody want to bring anything up for the agenda? If not, our next meeting is scheduled for October 17th. Okay. Um, and I think at that point, um, you know, we'll have more information uh, how Spark Growth is moving along. And uh, I believe Tony from the university will be able to join us for that meeting as well. Get status of conversations with them back on the agenda. I want to apologize, everyone. I was uh, I got a call. Um, unfortunately, someone didn't put the correct Zoom information in the link for the agenda, so oh, we no. cannot have our DEI meeting. And yeah. yeah, I had to let yeah. So I apologize for the you know not being able to hear you guys. Trust me, we've all been there, Crystal. Yeah, so sorry that that happened. <laughs> it's no one's fault. It, there's a lot going on in everyone's life, and you know, it's just what it is. It's been a really big year. This is leap year, so everyone has to give themselves a break. <laughs> exactly. You know, just give yourself I'll, a break. Better I will, next year. I will keep on checking and we'll keep on sending out the um, Zoom links in the agenda, but. Um, I had realized that I had set this up as a continuing meeting and this was the last session. So I have now added another six months or nine months under the same meeting code. So you can just, even if you can only find an old agenda, you should still be able to, um, to log in. Okay. All right. I appreciate that. That's something good to know because Alex was telling me that it was just showing up as X's. Okay. All right. Um, yeah. So would somebody like to make a motion to adjourn then? I would. Uh, and if you could just stay after Molly okay. for a moment. All right. Motion, motion to adjourn, to adjourn and there's a second? Yes. Second. Seconded by Crystal. All right. All those in favor? Aye, aye, aye. aye.